Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel and welcome back to the next episode of My Thoughts. Again, I'm going to do the whole rundown again, so if you have heard me say this before, you can go ahead and skip a few minutes. I'll probably try to put a time marker um, in the video where you can skip to, but this is a series where I will be ranking all of the Phase 4 MCU movies. We've already ranked all the Phase 4 Disney Plus shows, but right now we're ranking all of the Phase 4 movies. We are ranking all seven of them. The first one being the best film out of the bunch, and the seventh being the worst. As I said before, you can sort of break these films up into some broad categories. The top three being the best films. The middle two, so four and five, being mediocre, not bad, but not great. And then six and seven being absolute worst, painful to watch. And so far, if you've tuned into the first episodes, we have Shang-Chi ranked at the third spot and we have black widow ranked at the sixth spot so today we are going to be talking about the eternals this is the review that i have been if i'm being completely honest with you all dreading the most because i think as is fairly evident if you t ask anybody about this movie it is the most controversial and strongly opinionated film out of all of them in phase four and what i mean by that is from what i've found there are two categories of people there are those that really like the eternals movie and there are those that really dislike the eternals movies and I haven't heard many people say it's fine, it's not great, but, you know, it's passable, or, you know, it's bad, but, you know, it could be worse. I really haven't ran into too many people that hold sort of a neutral view on it. So, it's one of those things where MCU fans will either be very happy or very disappointed by my ranking. You're going to see where I fall on this spectrum it's probably going to make it so fairly evident at the start and again i will emphasize this is my list um, this is my opinion this is not meant to be a definitive list of what i think is objectively correct so leave your thoughts down below i'm going to encourage that for this episode specifically um, and this is going to be a rather weird episode and i'll get into why um, in a minute here but the Eternals is sort of unique in Phase 4 as it serves as the only group film that we actually got out of the entirety of Phase 4 because we didn't have an Avengers film. We did not have a, um, a you know, other team film. We really didn't have the Guardians of the Galaxy. Of course, we'll have the Guardians of the Galaxy holiday special, but that's not necessarily a team movie. So this is the first and only film that really focused on the team dynamic. And, of course, this was the first team film, really, that we've gotten since The Avengers. Um, and, you know, again, you can put Guardians in there, but the Guardians don't feel like a team because they all are sort of supposed to be in the same film as each other. And you would probably not see a member of the Guardians pop up in another individual's movie, and it make total sense. Just as the same way, you know, well, in, in sharp contrast, I think that we will likely see members of the Eternals start popping up in other films here and there. And, you know, it'll, it'll feel a little bit more like the Avengers eventually, but not exactly the same. So with that being said, this film also had a lot of new ideas that it had to bring to the screen. And it also had a very long runtime because as we've learned with the Avengers and why the Avengers work so well is you have to bring in people who have a background of knowledge on the characters that they are about to watch. They have to have some emotional connection to them. And considering this film, you know, had no setup of that sort. It was, you know, very much a hey, here are the Eternals, this is who they are, and this is your introduction to them, they had a lot to work with and a lot more than I think a lot of people would want to give them credit or credence for. So with that being said, 
typically, as I said, we will be going over the main characters, but I think because of how this film is set up, we have to analyze each of the Eternals themselves. As again, that's the only way a group works. So I will be attempting to analyze every member of the Eternals, and I'm going to try to make these quick, so if I don't talk about your favorite Eternal, if there is such a thing, then, you know, please, you know, be, you know, just understand that there's a reason why I am not talking about them super long, and it's because there are ten of them, plus I forget to a villain, and my favorite scene and least favorite scene, so that's why. So, without further ado, let's jump into it, starting with Cersei. So Cersei is the character that the film really wants us to care about. She becomes the unofficial official head of the Eternals because she is able to speak to Arishem. But that's pretty much about the max that I can even talk about Cersei. Her powers are not well explained at all. Um, in fact, I've watched the movie three times now, which is a task in and of itself. But... I still can't really even tell you what her powers are. Um, and her decision and thought process aren't well explained either. I think she had a, you know, a, a huge opportunity to sort of be this challenge to the, you know, the status quo of what the Eternals do and, you know, not set up Earth to be devoured. And she really doesn't do any of that. We learn a lot about her relationship with Icarus. And that really sort of leads nowhere. We get a romantic setup with her and the individual who's going to become the Black Knight. And again, we really don't get any, you know, new information or new character development from that. And I just can't say that she's a very great character. I'll be honest with you, she's rather forgettable. And you'll see that that's not a good thing when we start going down the other members of the Eternals. So number two is Icarus, and I'm going to make this one rather quick. Icarus is sort of the tropiest character out of the bunch. He is literally, they're not trying to hide the ball. He is the evil Superman stereotype that feels like has been done to death at this point in superhero films. And, you know, they don't really explain his motivation as to why. He wants to be that way either. He just sort of is. And he, you know, I think it is a fairly interesting idea that he wants to see the Earth destroyed after, you know, spending all this time with it. But it's, and with the people of Earth, but it's not very well explored. And out of every single death, I think, that we've seen in the MCU... I mean, I'm not convinced he's dead, but um, it would not surprise me if he comes back somehow. But he is the, the, the just has the most disappointing death out of any character we've seen so far in the MCU. I mean, literally flying into the sun. Not a great character. I wish I liked him more. I know a lot of people like him, but I just did not. Thena's number three. Thena had Mad Weary which could have been a really cool concept to explore more in depth. But as I've said before, when you're introducing 10 different characters and you're trying to explain them all, certain things are not explained, Mad Weary being one of them. It's very, very sort of disappointing because Thena turns into nothing more than just a powerhouse that doesn't have a soul that, you know, is the only one who can really rival Icarus's strength. And that's pretty much all I can say about her. I wish I liked her character. She, again, Mad Weary is an interesting concept, but extremely underexplored and underdeveloped. Ajak is the fourth one. She's a former leader of the Eternals. And that's about all we get to know about her. She could communicate with Arishem, and that's about it. We're supposed to feel something when Icarus kills her and feeds her to the Deviants. But we don't because we don't know anything of substance about her. And this is not the only character you're going to see this trend continue with. But again, I wish I had more to say about Ajak. They treat her like a very important character. 
but we're never told why she got to be the leader or why she is as important of a character as we are led to believe that she is. Five is Kingo. He's supposed to be the comedic relief character. Does not do a very good job of it. His cameraman, I will admit, the first time I watched the movie, gave me a few chuckles. Second time, I laughed once or twice. The third time, it grew very old on me. And in sharp contrast to most of the other characters that we've seen so far, his motivations are very clear. It makes absolute sense. You know, he wants to be a movie star. He wants to be the center of attention. He doesn't want to fight. He, you know, sort of goes on his own and wants to do his own thing. And, you know, that is more than I can say for a lot of these other characters. So I will give Kingo props or props are due. He might have one of the more fleshed out character stories out of all of the members of the Eternals. So there's at least one positive thing I can say. It took us five characters to get there, but there is one positive thing. Number six is Sprite. And Sprite, I think, is one of the most obvious examples of characters that you are supposed to feel sympathy for because, of course, she's stuck looking like a child and you're supposed to feel bad for her because she loves Icarus, but she looks like a kid, so Icarus is never going to view her that way. But she ends up just being an annoying character, and her ultimate betrayal of Cersei does not make any sense. I mean, if you've been friends with some for this long and you have had feelings for their significant other for this long, you're not just out of the blue going to betray them like that, or it's very unbelievable that you would. I mean, there's a reason why Icarus flew off and did not stay with them, is so he wouldn't have a real emotional attachment to them and what they had to do. Um, But that's an issue. And then how they conclude her character arc with Cersei being able to make her a human... Doesn't make any sense. Again, I really sort of winced every time she was given the spotlight in the film. So, again, just not a not a great character. Honestly, one of my least favorite characters in the entire film. Number seven is Fastos, and these next two are literally characters of the film sidelines until the very end, and then they play extremely important roles in the entirety of the rest of the film. So, they completely forgot about Fastos. He helped worked on the atomic bomb, which is a very weird and sort of insensitive inclusion, in my opinion. I mean, that was a that I mean that was a tragedy that many people lost their lives because of that event, and you sort of say that a character brought upon that there there's a lot of issues with that but he has cool powers he's very smart he's good at making things but we don't get to explore it much like most of the other characters because he's sidelined till the very end of the film so fastos could have been cool but he's not eight is makari and literally very end of the film she comes back she's the one who figures out where the new Eternal is going to be, you know, coming out of the Earth. And that's about all I can tell you about her because we don't know many of her personality traits. She, again, shows up at the very end. She has a weird relationship with Druig, but she runs fast. And that's about all I can say. I wish I could say more because I honestly feel like she could be a very cool character, but I literally can't because I literally do not know what else I could say about her because there we don't have any more information. Number nine is Druig, and in my opinion, he's the most thought-out character of the group. He clearly does not agree with the other Eternals, and he uses his powers to you know, try to make the world a better place. He hates seeing people kill themselves and war and violence and this often puts him at odds with the other members of the Eternals you know he has motivation unlike them and you know again he's sort of sidelined for a majority of the movie but we get to see a lot of his you know sort of character clashes with the others and I think that that's pretty cool he's probably my favorite 
Eternal, so I'd actually say that Druig is probably the best Eternal out of the 10, in my opinion. Last is Gilgamesh, and he has something with Thena. I don't know what it is. I don't know what you could classify it as. I don't think they're married. I don't think they're dating, but he likes her or loves her, and I guess she loves him. We never really get a good impression of if she does or if he does, but... He's there, he dies, his death is supposed to mean something, but as I've said about both Ajax and Icarus, we don't know him enough, so his death does not mean anything. In fact, it doesn't even seem like it means that much to the characters themselves as it sort of happens, and then they move on. And that's disappointing, because, again, I think Gilgamesh could have been set up as this, you know, sympathetic, you know, sort of he understands all perspectives and sides of what the Eternals are dealing with, but they don't. So, again, a disappointing character. So now that we got through all that, I'm going to quickly touch on the Deviants. They are, they were meant to be these monster-like creatures with no personalities for a reason, it's because the director wanted you to focus on the Eternals themselves and not have to worry about the super complex, you know, characteristics or personality traits of the villain of this film. It should have worked in this film, but it really didn't. Uh, the stakes with these guys don't ever seem to be high and... Despite the fact that there are literally monsters jumping around in these various cities, we've never heard of the Deviants mentioned again since the Eternals have happened. So keep that in mind. People know the Deviants are around. They've seen them. Not heard of them since in any subsequent project. So that shows you the impact that they have left on the MCU. Now I'm going to make these two fairly quick because again i know that this has already been a long video my favorite scene is the opening fight scene it sort of highlights all of the eternals and their strengths in a meaningful way it sets the hierarchy and again we are given a great okay this is what this team is about i thought it was very well choreographed they managed to put every single eternal in there give them their spotlight it was very good my least favorite scene is the ending as I said, Sprite becoming a human, don't know how that works. Uh, all of a sudden, Arishem coming back and taking the Eternals away. Some of them, the other ones, going away on their ship. Okay, I guess. And, of course, Icarus flying into the sun. Perhaps the dumbest way to end a film out of any way to end a film. Just overall disappointing. And with that being said, I think it's fairly clear where I fall on this film. It is ranked 7th out of 7. It is not a good film. I'll be honest with you, it is the only Marvel movie that I firmly struggle to watch. I cannot stand it. I don't think the film is great. I And I'll, I'll be honest with you, there is no series or no characters that would have been better served by having a Disney Plus series than The Eternals. If the Eternals had had a Disney Plus series, I think all of these issues could have been resolved. But the decision to not give them a Disney Plus series and sort of just throw them all in a movie is why this film stinks. And I don't think it... I think it could have been a great film. But again, how their characters were handled and built, just not great. And because of that, I have to say that it's ranked 7 out of 7. So, I can at least end this video on a positive note th and say that we are now through the two worst films of Phase 4. So, while a lot of the other films we'll be talking about are not great, they're at least better than the bottom two. So, once again, as I said at the very beginning, if you like The Eternals and you want to tell me why I'm wrong or I got an analysis of a character completely wrong, please leave it in the comments down below. If you agree with me, you can share that as well. But I just want to hear some conversation, share your thoughts, and I look forward to seeing you all in my next episode when we talk about Spider-Man No Way Home.
Super excited for that one and hope you are as well. I'll see you all then.